morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Thank you for coming out on this uh, Saturday morning. First of our panel discussion. My name is Blair Thomas, and I'm the director of the Puppet Festival. And I'm here with my colleagues. We one panel this morning at 10, and uh, then we have another one at 1 p.m. as well. Okay. Um, and I will just sit here and use this mic. We have uh, um, uh, the symposium happening today and the next Saturday as well. So I would like to just go ahead and begin by introducing the moderator for this morning's uh, symposium. And that's Paulette Richards here at my side, my colleague. <laughs> So Paulette Richards has survived a 10-month stint in Senegal as a 2013-14 Fulbright Scholar without contracting any tropical diseases. But sometime uh, during her service as an artist in residence at the Institut Francais in St. Louis, the puppet bug bit her hard. After returning, to Atlanta, she became a docent in the World of Puppetry Museum at the Center for Puppetry Arts. And when fellow members of the Decatur Makers introduced her to Arduino's microprocessors and stepper motors, she immediately thought of the animatronic dogs and dozers in the Henson Gallery at the museum and began designing her own rudimentary robots. Richards has taught animatronic puppetry workshops at the Friends School in Atlanta, Decatur Makers and DeKalb County Public Library, the Center for Puppetry Arts, and the Puppeteers of America 2017 National Festival. During the 2017-18 academic year, she worked for Georgia Tech's Center for Educational Integrating Science, Math, Computing as an innovator in residence at the Hollis Innovation Academy. Her mission in this encore career is to engage students who might not otherwise see themselves as innovators in STEM disciplines through animatronic puppetry. But she is also a scholar who's been working on a book and at the Puppet Festival we've been very honored to have her as an instructor in an online class over the past year and uh, where she has been trying out the ideas of her new book. Um, and uh, the book will be uh, published shortly by Rutledge. It's called Object Performance in the Black Atlantic, the United States. So uh, it's very, very excited to have this scholarship come forward soon. But today, she has uh, put together, uh, along with myself, we collaborated on this idea of creating a panel discussion uh, entitled Boundless Bodies. And uh, so I'm gonna pass it on to Paulette Richards. Thank you. Thank you, Blair. Thank our panelists. And thank the audience for coming out so early. Um, this panel was sort of born in conversation with the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And they indicated an interest in addressing some of the more theoretical approaches that um, students in the art school are exposed to. And one of the hot topics in the art world these days is the whole realm of what we call post-humanism. Uh, you may also have heard of object-oriented ontology or agential realism or the new materialism or many other buzzwords like that. Um, this morning we are in kind of an improvisational mode because it took us some time to pull our tech team together, but we have excellent panelists to help us start wrapping our heads around these ideas. And boundless bodies is the first subject that we came up with. Um, the notion of object-oriented ontology, ontology being the question of how do we know what's real is especially um, 
I think puppetry brings an, a special lens to that line of inquiry because we're dealing with objects all the time and we are negotiating with objects all the time. And even though the Western tradition uh, does not admit the agency of the object, as object performers, we are always wrestling with <laughs> objects that seem to have agency. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We're glad you could make it. Um, because regardless of what you have blocked, when the puppet does not want to move this way instead of that way, then you have to work that out with the puppet. So we are constantly running into the material world in a way that um, forces us to think about what are the bounds of our own human bodies and consciousness and what is the agency, existence, animus, whatever you want to attribute to the material objects that we encounter. So boundless bodies, we're starting with this question centered in the body. Um, and the shows that we have represented on the panel uh, speak very directly to those questions. So I'm very glad to have um, our presenters with us. I'm going to introduce them and then they will each speak for about 20 minutes. Then we will have 20 to 30 minutes of conversation within the panel where I will be trying to connect what they've said more closely with the philosophical point that we're trying to explore. And then we will open the floor for questions. There are microphones on either, in the aisles on either side of the center here. So when we open the floor for questions, if you have a question, please come forward to the microphone so that you will be heard. Um, and then we will take your question from the floor. So um, looking forward to beginning this journey with you. Thank you. And now I'm going to introduce Ishmael Falke, who is our first presenter with Lives Mid... Live, ah, I practiced before. Lives Medlet. Yes. yes, I practiced beforehand <laughs> and I blew it, but anyway. Okay, so you are in the Google Drive. Yeah, so I'm looking on my phone because I want to keep pretty things on the screen instead of all the junk that's on my computer. So, Ishmael Falke is a puppeteer and performing artist as well as a teacher. He is interested in stories told by materials and spaces in redefining the body in contradictions, in the breaking down of old and familiar stories, and in their reconstruction. Born in Israel, Palestine in 1977, and based in Finland since 2001, Falke's works were presented in various venues from national theaters to garbage cans. Um, in about 30 countries around the world. And we were awarded, and were awarded both in Finland and internationally. He also published literature of both practice and theory of puppets, okay, uh, and theater art. So we are in good hands uh, with Mr. Falke. So I'm going to let this little screen go and bring up his website so we can look at some of the images from the show that he's doing here at the festival, which is Invisible Lands. So without further ado, let's welcome Ishmael Falk. So am I coming through or is it, uh, do you hear me? Yes, good. So uh, thank you, Paulette. Going to the introducing and uh, yeah. let's see. All right, I will sit close. 
Okay, so um, thank you for introducing and uh, big thanks for the festival for inviting. I'm very happy to, to be here and performing Invisible Lands. Uh, Paulette gave an introduction about me. I will give a brief introduction about uh, our company, which is actually uh, Duetto. Uh, so I work with the dancer choreographer Sandrina Lindgren, and uh, our um, our theater duo is called Leaves Medlet, which is a Swedish word uh, that is uh, tough to pronounce, but uh, it means uh, groceries or an essential grocery things, you elementary things that you you uh, get, um, and. This, my background is in puppetry, and the her back background is in uh, dance and choreography. And what we are doing uh, for already about 12 years is that we uh, try to create, we are creating uh, different kinds of hybrids between puppetry and dance. So the topic of our symposium, Boundless, uh, Bodies, uh, is, I feel, relating quite directly to, to our work in, in different forms. Um, just a, a, few, a few words about how we, how we uh, work together. Uh, we try to, to avoid uh, dividing the creative process in this sense that uh, uh, okay, you, you, will, you will do a, a dance scene, I will do a puppetry scene, and then we just uh, put it up together. Instead, we try to um, really work on, on each element of the show, uh, starting from very, like, discussing the, the concept uh, and up to the very last details. And from both perspective of uh, puppetry and body. And eventually, as the more we work together, the more we find out that uh, they are not separate objects, but they are together. So what is uh, uniting is the, that we are, um, we are object-based. So whether the object is uh, a, a live organism or an, uh, what is kept as inanimate, uh, it is still it 's still an object it is a material, and in this sense we are we are materialists that that um, yeah that manifest in in different in different ways I feel that it is um, uh, richness to in this work to be able to step out of one 's own um, uh, i would say the uh, on art discipline conventions. Uh, so I know myself that uh, since I've been educated in puppetry and uh, working also outside of our theater duo with a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, puppeteers, so uh, for good and bad there are many conventions uh, how, on how you should approach a play and also on traditional uh, roles within the working group. And uh, then again, dance field has their own conventions. So when you're working with someone from, from a different field, you have, to, you have to go over these conventions and find out uh, what, is, what is working in practice. And, and often it becomes something new. So I'm going to present our work through uh, three different shows that we made. Uh, I will start with Invisible Lands that is uh, here in this festival. You can still see us three times, today and tomorrow. Um, and Invisible Lands is, um, is a show that we created in 2015. Uh, in spring 2015, and uh, we started to work on it uh, just with, uh, w without a theme, just with uh, artistic inspiration to combine miniature figures and create uh, body landscapes for them. So we experimented for quite a while with 
with this material uh, until we developed a certain language, but we still did not have any direction or a theme for it. And as it happened, we were scheduled to have a premiere in Finland in April 2015, and, and as we are approaching our premiere, the big crisis of refugees uh, coming to Europe was uh, happening around, and uh, the images of uh, refugees, uh, long lines of refugees in, in different uh, landscapes, and uh, uh, boats of refugees at sea, uh, the images were overflowing from, uh, from the media. And then, uh, and then we realized that, okay, if there is one thing that we should tell at this moment, uh, it's, it's this. Should, uh, it should reflect what is happening in the world. So this is how the, the, the basically the theme and the um, medium came together in our show. So it is a show about refugee uh, travels, and we play uh, very strongly on scale using uh, two parallel visual narratives, one uh, very miniature scale, and the other on the full body. Um, so, and, and we try to use this uh, duality, this physical duality of the big bodies and the miniature puppets in order to suggest uh, many different perspectives on, on this uh, phenomenon of refugee travels. Without judging it, we don't need to, without adding any, uh, any drama to, to a phenomenon that is already dramatic enough. Um, so we found out that uh, working in, um, working very intimately to, uh, with the audience, the audience is actually surrounding us in a, in a public seat that is a little bit formed like a boat. Uh, a small refugee boat, so we are sitting all very tightly together, and uh, people are uh, very close. Uh, it's it's very sensitive in a way, uh, but very rough. Uh, and um, and we use images that, for example, um, uh, we use a view from uh, a binocular. Uh, so a person watching from binocular over a landscape and seeing something else, we use video projection, projection with this. Uh, but we also offer, we offer the perspective of a single person that is running for their lives, but also a perspective of uh, a pilot of a helicopter that is hunting down uh, uh, these people and also the viewpoint of uh, a news anchor. So we try to use all these different viewpoints, and uh, we found out that, that combining, combining uh, the physical body uh, with this uh, inanimate uh, small figures that are not really puppets, they are, they are tiny little bits of plastic, but, uh, um, but they are bodies still. So combining these two uh, opens up ability to connect with this uh, phenomenon in many different ways, and this is what we wish to give, not to come up with a certain slogan or saying, but just to offer the audience a possibility to watch. And um, the bodies, they become, they become a platform uh, for, um, for private, uh, say like a private events, uh, very uh, private, intimate events. Uh, somebody uh, physical actions. Uh, somebody is holding their breath underwater, for example. Uh, somebody is taking care of another person which is uh, wounded. But it's also uh, a platform because of the different scales. It's a platform for a whole geopolitical uh, event, or many events actually. Uh, we did it originally for for Europe, but uh, as we were performing it here, there already came up comments about uh, 
uh, people immigrating from Mexico, for example. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, and we created it 2015, thinking that uh, we, we, will, um, we will connect and comment on something which is uh, relevant now. We did not have any idea that it's going to be relevant for so long, unfortunately. It's still relevant. Um, yeah, I think this is, uh, this is about invisible lands. Um, then I will give uh, two more examples of uh, different shows that we did where we are using, um, we are combining bodies and objects. So uh, the next show I'm speaking about is called Full Measures. And uh, this is, uh, it's again, it's a duet, uh, but it's actually uh, a trio for, a trio for uh, puppeteer, dancer, and um, foldable measuring sticks. I'm not sure how do you call them here. Uh, and uh, it's the kind of sticks that uh, carpenters use, for example. And uh, uh, it discusses the, how uh, our, uh, our culture's uh, obsession to measure everything uh, as much as possible is affecting uh, our body and transforming our world and how, how our body is, is actually becoming uh, yeah, measured all the time. And uh, um, there is, uh, it, it's not a new phenomenon, but uh, I think it has been uh, taken to the extreme in the last years. There is a um, um, kind of movement called the, the quantified self. Um, uh, and um, probably everybody here uh, recognized this from uh, your mobile phone is counting your steps uh, and uh, some smart watches are counting whatever uh, pulse and tell you how did you sleep at night and uh, advise you to. So we are. We are measuring all the time everything. Uh, also on, on uh, socio sociological levels, we are turning everything possible, all, all different values of, uh, um, just as an example, uh, uh, values of uh, uh, care or togetherness or um, uh, affection, uh, whatever kind of, abstract but, but existing values are uh, put down into numbers, uh, grades. And once uh, you quantify everything into numbers, then you, um, uh, you, you gain certain kind of knowledge, but you lose a lot of other knowledge. Uh, so in this show, could you uh, pass to the next picture? Yes. This one. Um, we uh, play with, we create a world that is uh, made entirely of these measure sticks. Uh, and, and we depict how two random people uh, kind of transform from, uh, from uh, how to say, uh, from a very, um, intelligent or kind of socially aware uh, uh, people that can uh, have a conversation. Uh, how do how we regress as people into a primitive uh, uh, stage uh, while the measure sticks just come more and more and transform the whole stage. So that's, um, this is another way to uh, approach connection between bodies and objects. Um, now you will actually will see a short, uh, kind of lightly adapted scene of it in tonight's Nasty, Brutish and Short, it's called, mm -hmm. yeah, the cabaret. Uh, so yeah, so welcome to get a small impression. Um, yeah, then um, uh, another show, uh, which is called Inevitable, translated from Finnish and Swedish. Uh, in English, it would be Inevitable. And uh, this is a show that is uh, made out completely from objects. 
It's a story of uh, a history of 100 years uh, uh, that uh, the whole show is one very long domino effect of, of chain of uh, reactions. Um, so what you see here uh, is the 40s. And, um, and uh, you see uh, 30s, maybe, no, 30s. And uh, then um, uh, basically they are not actors, no actors. They are just uh, objects uh, um, dropping, pushing, um, uh, like whatever, uh, causing other objects to react, and and the audience is following the reaction through a very very big space. Uh, and but there are people there, and the people are used as objects also. Um, could you pass on to the next one? Sure. So we do use uh, performers that are uh, located there. You don't see their, their face. Uh, and uh, they, are doing, uh, they are doing kind of everyday actions, but their actions are also part of the, uh, the whole chain reaction. So what we are, uh, from this point of view of body and uh, objects, what we discuss in, in this piece is how uh, how our body and and how we as a kind of entity individuals are uh, part of um, of a random chain of reaction and how do we build our different narratives of history, politics, whatever, based on a certain perspective that we have on this great uh, domino uh, chain. Uh, that is uh, life and, and, and the universe, and uh, where our bodies that we try to define as, as ours, that we have the agency on them uh, to decide uh, what to do with them, they are, they are actually just a part of, of this uh, reaction chain. So uh, in, that's inflicting also on our decisions. And uh, the point uh, here is not, uh, is not so much a fatalism as, as it may sound, but more uh, maybe to kind of create a certain kind of empathy uh, from this humble point of view that uh, we are all connected through this chain of reaction. And throughout this, uh, or like, in the, in the different shows that we create, our main um, main uh, message, hidden message that we try to kind of plant uh, is that uh, through the through the bodily aspect of both objects and and humans, uh, we can create a certain kind of empathy uh, because for theater viewers. To watch thing, you can watch something in, on an intelligent level. Uh, you can process uh, text and, and other ideas, but then uh, there is a certain level of physical identification that we do, uh, physical well, physical empathy that uh, that our body feels, and it's a kind of route that uh, passes by the the intelligent part and goes directly to our lizard brains, <laughs> and, but does affect us, uh, deeply affect our opinions and how we do. And we find out that uh, through um, having the, the physical and the bodily in, uh, ve on a very uh, yeah, prominent place, we can, we can access much more this kind of empathy. I think that's it. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Great. I made notes. You did a very good job of linking to the overall theme, and so I have things to talk about with you afterwards. So our next presenter is, um, let me get into the bio. to the wrong place. This is the right place. Okay. So this is Julie 
Le Cor, who says that during her higher education, her passion for the performing arts saw her gravitate towards assisting artistic programs and cultural engineering. A graduate with a bachelor's in cultural outreach, she joined the National School of Theater Arts. Sorry, this is tiny on my phone. <laughs> I can't see it. Yes, the National School of Theater Arts and Techniques, um, which is abbreviated as NSAT, where she trained in production and administration jobs. After graduating from the school in 2008, she took up an assistant job at the budget and payroll department of the Théâtre National de Chaillot, where she assisted the executive director with managing the budget of the organization. She soon became head of budget and financial controller. In 2013, she became the executive director of the World Puppet Theater Festival in Charleville-Mézières, thus combining her appreciation for the arts of puppetry and her desire to expand her core line of work. While supervising the administrative and coordination aspects of the event alongside management, she encountered many French and international artistic teams and promoted the art of puppetry, which decidedly contemporary dimension revives, challenges, and breaks down the boundaries between the arts. Artists who are spearheading this revival include Elise Vigneron from the Théâtre de l'Entrouvert and Violaine Fimbel, Compagnie Yokai, both of whom she has assisted since 2019. So we are very honored to have Julie to speak about Anywhere, which is um, Elise Vigneron's production, and um, which has now been set on the US company that presents it to you here at the festival. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Well, um, can you hear me? It's OK? OK. I'll try to do my best to represent Elise. Uh, she unfortunately cannot be here in the US with us. Um, so I'm not their artist, but I will, I think, uh, I, I will do my best to, to pass her away to her puppet, puppetry approach, uh, which is a um, very specific uh, way to um, work and um, approach the puppetry and the art with um, proposing a very sensitive experience. Um, she puts the, um, she, she, she put the, the ephemer uh, of our existence uh, in the center of, his, of her work. Um, she's, um, she's, um, She's doing that using the materials. She has always used um, the ephemer lives of materials since her first show. Um, it was in uh, 2010. Her first show was created and called Traversée. We have some, we have some images of Traversée. Sorry, I have sure. named the, the different issues. Maybe yes, we I can see have it. this. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, great. Thank you. Um, this first show uh, was um, traversé means going through, going through uh, philosophical some things. Uh, it's like a path between different um, different moments of life, and she's using uh, she used for that many different materials that we know that they are supposed to fade away quite quickly, like leaves, nature, um, wood. Uh, everything that can um, that you can find in nature in your environment, and they are supposed to disappear. And it's something that it's always um, a parallelism uh, between uh, material and uh, our human being uh, lives. 
Um, and puppetry for that is uh, the way that Ellie's trying to share with this experience, this human experience, but I'm living experience. Um, for that, the, she's not, she's puppetry, uh, she's involved in puppetry, but she's uh, calling her approach the um, martial, um, um, martial movement, and it's, um, it means that it's not just, she, she never named it like object, she, like, she named it like um, material, and this is, uh, sometimes we can find material uh, um, embodying the, um, the nature or embodying the lives, and sometimes we can have in, in their show human being shapes too. So there is puppets and materials, Definitely this puppet has, um, like, I think we can see in our, in our um, approach that puppet, puppet, the puppet uh, is like a double. Um, we were discussing yesterday with Paulette about is it an extension of human or is it something else out of the human being? I guess it's both, of course, but it's really uh, have to be uh, considered like a double of the human um, in his met its metamorphosis and his way to disappear. So this traversé uh, traversé show was um, uh, with Mary many different stations, and the, the spectator is invited to to being uh, there through. Um, the first um, the first version was for indoor, but after it she recreated for outdoor, and now it's performed in uh, outdoor space, like very natural, very natural spaces, like uh, in wood or in uh, yes forest new, uh, wood, and including now um, um, there is a human manipulating the puppet, but there is also um, an animal. There is a horse uh, going through the going through the, um, the scenography, and uh, it's this is something really strong that we you, we, you have um, because you know this human being manipulating the puppet is quite it's. Uh, both um, both a fellow and uh, someone that we have sometimes to, to forget. Uh, you know, we, we work, we, Ishmael talked about this convention with Perpetri, and this horse is really embodying the, the, um, the yes, the, the animal li life, the lives, sorry, life, sorry. So this Traverse show was the first one uh, uh, from uh, Ellie's uh, approach work. And um, then after, after this experience with the, uh, this material, she, 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 uh, she begins, she starts, start, started to work with this very uh, intriguing and uh, a very uh, autonomous uh, material, which is ice for uh, her next uh, following shows. Uh, so that's how uh, Anywhere um, born, uh, was born. Uh, Anywhere's show was created in 16, um, 2016. Uh, it's based on the novel Oedipus on the Road from a Belgian author called um, Henri Beauchot. This author um, proposed to write uh, what happened between the moment uh, of Oedip Oedipus uh, have, has just uh, left um, his, uh, uh, his city and uh, becoming blind by himself, and the moment he arrives in Cologne and it's the end of his life. So this is the journey and this is the, the path of this moment that does it didn't exist in the tragedies uh, first uh, um, first re uh, rights uh, plays. So um, this is the um, the proposition in this show 
to um, to accompany accompany this uh, journey from a deep and uh, a deep uh, journey with his uh, daughter Antigone. And uh, Elise uh, proposed uh, to um, to make this Oedipus embodied by uh, by his puppet. Uh, this eye puppet is, uh, of course, because its eyes melting during the show. And this is uh, something that she she proposed to the spectator to to questioning his um, ephemera uh, um, per, per se, per se uh, I mean, uh, being here um, uh, on, on the earth. And it's questioning the fragility of our lives, but um, the fragility of the relationships too. Um, this is questioning the, what is visible and invisible because um, Oedipus is fading away, but is still here with his soul. And this is uh, something that uh, it's allows with the, with this ice pep tree, and it's questioning to the the trail, the mark of our passage presence uh, on earth on earth. Um, and it is something that um, uh, Elise, uh, I think it's one of the answer for her about how she wants to, to, to bring the questioning, uh, the question of um, our metamorphosis and the relationship between what is presence and what is absent of our lives. It's kind of dealing with the, <laughs> the shadows uh, Shadows world too. Um, this is something very particular um, here to, um, in Chicago's festival this year because uh, Elise and Blair uh, decided to um, to um, transmit um, this uh, this work to a U.S. Uh, young U.S. team, and so that's them who's performing the show here in the festival. Uh, it's, uh, it was um, uh, three weeks of uh, rehearsal to transmit this show. Uh, it was um, decided and thought during the pandemic moment, I guess, because Blair is here, of course, this is something uh, very strong. He, he could, uh, he could uh, tell and uh, chat with you. Um, that was very, uh, it is a very um, successful and emblematic show of their company and it was transmitted to, it was important for Elise and Blair to, with this whole pandemic issues, to find another way to create and transmit and um, travel all around the world with our, our artistic um, proposition. So that was um, an amazing, a great and amazing moment to, 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 to share with, uh, with you this new form, this new shape. Um, so it's, um, it's supposed to, 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 to travel all around the US then. Uh, and it was very interesting, um, as Ishmael uh, said before, for this, uh, for this show, it was a, a meeting between a puppeteer for the, par the puppet part and a dancer, performer. So we are all again, uh, thinking, um, uh, speaking about these different conventions. Um, this is something very interesting in this new show because this is the encounter between this material world embodied by the puppets and this human body. And it's uh, another relationship in this new show because of this different uh, knowledge, uh, I mean, skills before. Um, than the the French shows, so that's it. that's something I guess we can discuss after. Um, just to I don't know exactly, maybe a guess. I'm quite um, at the end of the presentation, but um, this show with the eyes part, this eyes um, um, 
uh, yes, the ice reflection um, uh, created a new cycle, ice cycle in um, Ellie's uh, artistic approach. So she created a, um, a, a long uh, residency with uh, people, inhabitants. Uh, it's called Lens. And it's, she worked with, the, the, again, this trail, this, this way to, to be here or not to be here anymore. Uh, and this ice is really interesting to work for, uh, and on that with people. Um, during two months, they molded feet of feet of people um, to uh, embody uh, the the presence of this person because feet is where you stand from, and this is where you are grounded, and in the same time. This is your trail, this is your trail, um, uh, very material trail, but of course your, your philosophic trail. And it smelled, it smells of course, because it's eyes. So that was very powerful to uh, share it with people. They didn't see for lots of them, they didn't see anywhere, they didn't know the puppets, um, the puppetry or didn't know Elisa Spratch, and this is something that was very strong. See this uh, feed just before, the one before, with someone uh, quite um, uh, aging with this, like if she was being in her shoes, but it's the feet disappearing, and th there's something very strong that, that is uh, pictured here. Uh, and um, and the next show um, uh, she's uh, working on uh, it will be created in October 23 um, will be um, um, then a nice uh, there will be again uh, ice puppets um, but there will have uh, there will be <laughs> sorry human size ice puppets uh, for five. Um, five persons, uh, five manipulators, uh, like doubles of them. There's still this questioning about double, doubles, metamorphosis. And it's based on the novel uh, Les Vagues, The Waves, <laughs> uh, from Virginia Woolf, which questioning, this, this is this, the same, this theme that we, we have again there about the, um, the ephemera, the ephemera uh, presence of, um, of the human being and questioning. And there is a very uh, strong uh, work done with the voice, the sound of the waves, and this material ice becoming water, what is not nothing, because the ice is not just disappearing, it's something else, it's water, it's about the metamorphosis. Um, well, I guess I'm pretty, pretty done. Yeah, it's OK. <laughs> OK, thank you so much. Um, next, we have Camille Trouvé from Les Anges au Plafond. Um, I'm going to introduce Camille, and then there will be a little moment where I'm fumbling to open the Angel Plafond website so that we can get some images of Raj while she speaks. Um, but bear with us, we will get it all together. So uh, Camille Trouvé had her uh, training in puppetry in Glasgow and then founded the company Les Angel Plafond with Bryce Berthoud. They have 12 shows that they've created together and they have been touring all over France and in international puppet festivals. Since uh, 2021, both Bryce Bertou and Camille Trouvé direct the National Theater in Rouen. So that was uh, what we got very quickly, and there are many more um, credits to her name, but that's what we have for now. And uh, just give me a moment to jump on the... Blair, did you email that to me? Okay, just jump in there. Don't look at my <laughs> email, email threads. 
and um, we will be, yes, honored to hear from Camille. Here we go. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I'll try to do my best in English <laughs> uh, to present the company Les Anges au Plafond. So we founded the company in 2000, yes, in, uh, with Boris Berthoud, which is a great puppeteer. We met um, uh, in a festival, in a, in a puppetry festival, and we decided to found a company together. And the, the strange thing is that we decided to exchange the role all over the creation uh, uh, travel. Sometimes he's performing on stage and I'm directing him. And uh, the, the reverse thing is, is um, uprising when I, I'm performing and he's uh, directing me. And at first it was like a game. We choose this way of uh, working. And it became a real link in between all the shows of the company. And we've been building 12 shows on this uh, theory. And then after, at first it was like a little solo of uh, puppetry. And as years go by, shows became bigger and we had a whole team around us and um, we take a whole stage. We, we started on the table and then after we, we expand the universe of Les Anges au Plafond on the whole stage. Um, we were really inspired with Master of Puppetry. Um, I mean, I think puppetry is something like a shock when you first met a Master of Puppetry or an image of puppetry that really uh, shock your imaginary. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, Ilka Schenbein, for example, or Philippe Gentil, or Fabrizio Montecchi, or um, Galvin Glover from um, the, I mean, many master of puppetry I really uh, appreciate and that inspired my universe. And the universe of Les Anges au Plafond is rooted in uh, transdisciplinary practice mm -hmm. so that we are mixing the language of the body, the language of the material, material, the language of the music, and the text. And we are trying to connect all these practices into a, a on stage into the, the show. Uh, and everything is created at the same time. This is quite a, a way of working. That is, we are not starting with a text, a, write, uh, a text that is written. We are starting with a vision of manipulation, vision of the space. Scenography is like our main uh, puppet, our big, is, it's like a big puppet on stage. Mm -hmm. We are manipulating the scenography with a lot of strings and tricks and trap and <laughs> things that uh, pop up and appear, expand on stage. So scenography is designed by Brice Berthoud usually and is like creating the space as a huge puppet. And then I, I usually design the puppets and I'm trying to really go into the, the link in between the puppeteer and his puppet to try to make a, um, a language. Uh, what is, in dramaturgy, what, is, what does it mean to manipulate a puppet on stage on this story, and what will be the role of the manipulator, and what is the link in between the two? Um, for example, in Raj, we could say that the main character is a human, is an actor, um, is, uh, is, uh, um, is uh, performing uh, the, the, the role of a writer, and all the puppets are part of his imaginary world, is uh, getting out of the book. 
So there is a link in between the, the actor, the puppeteer, and the, all the puppets on stage. Um, the, the main, uh, in the company, we, we rooted our imaginary world into the Greek myth. As we start, we started, and it's very nice to hear about Oedipe sur la route from Henri Beauchot, because it was one of our book reference book as well. Because we, we've been building two shows about Antigone and Oedipe. With this kind of game with Brice and I, so I, I directed him in Oedipe and he directed me in Antigone. Mm -hmm. And it, it really gave a, a ground for the company, like an, a, a place where our imaginary is uh, working. And then after we choose two contemporary myths, with, which are Camille Claudel, which is a great artist, French artist, sculptor from the 19th century, who faced a really hard censorship in her work, because at that time in France, um, sculpture was not allowed for women. So she had to really fight hard to find a way and to impose her vision, artistical vision and independency, uh, apart from uh, men and from masters of sculpture. And um, the second character we, we talk the life of is Romain Gary. And that is the show we are presented actually in the festival, uh, Raj is the show, the story about Romain Gary, which is um, a great, great uh, writer in France. But his story is incredible because he's a magnificent, magnificent uh, swindler. Mm -hmm. he, he just, um, he had, um, he, is, he was born in Russia uh, in the early 10th, uh, in the early 20th century. And uh, at this moment in Europe, um, he, uh, I mean, how, how will I? <laughs> okay. he, he went through, through whole Europe with his mother because of the pogroms uh, starting in Europe. In, uh, in Europe, and then the, the mother has the idea of taking his child her child to France, and it was like uh, it, the first part of the show is the big travel through Europe, and the mother protecting her child from the the, the violence and the absurdity of fascism. She is uh, building for him a, a, a world in which uh, everything is uh, a story and she's protecting his imagination from the violence of the world. So she creates, so in a part, uh, a vision in which reality and fiction are really close and mixed, and there is no borders, there are no borders in between. And at first it was like a treasure for the young uh, Romain Gary, because she was believing in him, uh, raising him, saying that he will become a, a huge man, a, an important guy. But at a certain part of his life, it became like a, a wound. Um, and he had difficulties to make the difference in between fiction and reality. And he became the, the promise that it gave his mother at the dawn of his life became a kind of difficulty to, to, to get through. And he reinvented himself around 40 years old into another character, uh, another writer, another, and he, he became this kind of swindler, uh, a war, uh, warning twice the Goncourt Prize and making a big, um, uh, a big uh, intrigue around his writing. Uh, did, I, did I manage to explain all this in English? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
that's the, um, the show we are presenting now in, in Chicago, Raj, with a human-sized puppet made out of papers and uh, uh, built about the imagination of this uh, author, Romain Gary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, our panelists have given us a lot to chew on. So let's see if I can um, find a path for us to start digesting and connecting um, some of what was said. I'm looking for a file because we had a description and a thought for what this panel would be. And I just need to find that. Oh, yay, it's there. Okay, I'm just going to read you what we originally wrote. Um, on the idea of boundless bodies, and then I'll start weaving things together. So um, the other thing about the exploration of post-humanist, object-oriented ontology, et cetera, et cetera, theory, um, which I sat down in September and read a big stack of books and then made a report to Blair, <laughs> is that most of it is extremely Eurocentric and in my mind was an excuse to keep talking about Heidegger. So um, <laughs> I um, recognize the fact that cultures all over the world have been asking these questions throughout human history. And so I went to Hindu philosophy to find another uh, perspective on it. And so this is what we're getting here. In, his do, in Hindu cosmology, the rhythmic energy of Shiva Tandavas, of Shiva's Tandava dance is the source of all movement in the universe, propelling the cycle of creation, preservation, and dissolution. So there goes the ice puppet. The purpose of the dance is to release humans from illusion. And our biggest illusion is that we are the center of the universe. Since the puppet body can be an extension of the puppeteer's body, or a separate object that forces us to negotiate with matter that is distinct from our human bodies. Object performances such as Lives Medlet theaters, I think I got it this time, got it <laughs> Invisible Lands, can readily explore how human consciousness might transcend the boundaries of our own bodies. So that would take you outside transcendence, but the Tandava dance takes place in Chidambaram, the center of the universe, which actually lies within the heart, the human heart. Thus, um, Théâtre de l'Entrouvert's Anywhere stages a journey that illustrates how we can find transcendence through imminence. I'm a dancer, first and foremost, and so imminence is important to me because as a dancer, you have those moments where you are so um, connected with your body that your consciousness ex expands um, to a feeling that you are the whole universe or the universe is a part of you. There is no separation. So instead of stepping outside of the body, um, you go within to find the whole of creation. So with that um, preamble, then I'm going to go through. I think what I'll do first is ask each panelist to reflect on, in their practice, the extent to which um, you use the puppet as an extension of the body or um, where you work with the puppet as something that is separate from the body. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, would you like to go first, Ishmael? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's fine. Um, yeah, I think I think that uh, we uh, there is a certain definition, uh, visual definition that you need to make between uh, puppeteer and puppet, but uh, but that's uh, it's not the same as something that we would like to achieve. Uh, like in this sense that uh, we want to make a difference between uh, the object and the body. I think mostly we would like to blur the image mm -hmm. 
Um, so sometimes we would, uh, at some places we would maybe uh, hide uh, the object and, and expose more the body, but it depends. Um, Maybe we would put the border not uh, mm -hmm. between object and body, but between different, uh, like for example, if I'm holding on to this microphone, so it's not uh, me or the microphone, but it can be like uh, this part from the sleeve, and then uh, this, and this is important, like, uh, uh, but this is not important, and this is not important, mm -hmm. as an example. Mm. Um, so we can reach some kind of a hybrid that uh, will tell us something else. Okay, yeah. that's beautiful. Okay. Julie? Um, <clears throat> I would say that my understanding of Ellie's process is that is some kind of um, mirror. And it's, I, would, I would answer that it's not an extension. It's a, f a mindly extension, but it's not a... Um, um, there is there is something sep definitely separate separated between the bo both of them, um, but it's the double. So that's that's the the, um, the figure uh, that we maybe we recenter our humanity on this um, on this puppet on this material to to get the conscious consciousness of our uh, very short time, uh, ephemeral ephemer time on, on Earth. So I, I would say that, uh, I would say that it's the, the human body is a, a kind of a disappearing to let this material uh, being the center of of the, um, the proposition. Okay. Thank you. And Camille? Um, in my opinion, I mean, as long as I'm building the puppets, I've got a sort of uh, animist mm. thinking when I'm in my working place. Uh, I used to put little candles and stuff like that. When I will, um, you know, make, make the, the thing alive, and it's not an extension of myself, it's, it's rather a projection of my imagination on a material thing, which is completely inert. And then with this kind of little uh, ceremony, uh, I, I'm, I must admit I'm doing still, <laughs> uh, I, I, I give to the, to the material, to the, to the sculpture, uh, the light of life. I, I mean, I really, I really still believe in this, uh, it, this magical thing. Mm -hmm. And then after, um, I give the puppet all the responsibility for telling the story on stage in front of the audience. I'm, I'm really like uh, relay, relying on the object to be the, the medium in between the audience and my imagination. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm talking to the puppet before the show saying, <laughs> go for it, you will be great tonight. <laughs> You will, you will just have them in the eyes. And, mm -hmm. and when I'm performing, I'm really like hiding myself a little bit uh, behind the puppet and saying, go for it, uh, be, be, be brilliant. And mm -hmm. So I, I still got this uh, animist thing, mm -hmm. thinking, which is also in the Japanese theater very important. They, they believe that when you perform with a puppet along many, many times, it, it charges itself, itself in, in, in energy, mm -hmm. and if you don't manipulate it, it will become an object again. Mm -hmm. And this, this way in between object and uh, magical object on stage mm -hmm. uh, is something I just keep, keep being fascinated about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. thank you, that's great. So I have three prongs to come in, which is wonderful. Unfortunately, one theorist's name has escaped me at the moment, and I'm supposed to keep this screen up during the things I can't go, you know, searching in my computer. But there's a concept called entanglement, 
between um, objects in the material world. And what Ishmael described illustrates that exactly. So as you're performing um, with objects, then these entanglements between them create a new object um, which could have its own entity, as it were. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's actually written, and I'll, you know, I'll dig up the name of the theorist that talks about that later, but so we're, at, we're in the same field. Then Julie, when you're talking about the double, and also in your remarks earlier, um, the concept that come to me is one that philosophers talk about in the realm of phenomenology. And do not get afraid of that word. I hang with it because I think about the Muppet sketch with the cows going, phenomena, do, 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 do. Okay. And so every time I have to deal with phenomenology, I think about that, and then I'm able to say it and, and, and not be um, put off by it because it, it gets really esoteric. But phenomenology is the study of consciousness. Um, and what is the relationship between our human consciousness and whatever may be outside of human consciousness? Because we can argue back and forth about whether there's anything outside of your own consciousness, or maybe you are all figments of my imagination and I'm dreaming that we're sitting here mm -hmm. having this conversation. Um, but within that discussion, we talk about apprehending. And so this double that you have brought up is a way of apprehending whatever is other or outside of the consciousness. Would you say that's an accurate paraphrase? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, so we're on solid ground. This is something that has been hashed and rehashed for a good while and we can all have our opinions about it. Then, um, Camille, thank you for coming out as an animist. <laughs> I also <laughs> consider myself to be an animist and so one of my frustrations in reading this post-humanist theory is, once again, they all want to talk about Heidegger, but they all want to link it to science. Um, and so they will also go to Niels Bohr, the physicist who wrote a lot of philosophy. Um, and because they still think that they have to justify everything according to the paradigms of science and rationalism, they will go to the very edge, but will not admit animism. It's like, ooh, no. Mm -hmm. So, um, and yet your practice is one that resonates with many puppeteers. Um, and in many cultures, the idea of the puppet um, having this life force is natural and normal, and they would be wondering why we think that it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So thank you for bringing up that point. Um, let me see if I can pull together one other question set to go through, and then we'll open the floor for the audience, because I hope that we've got your mind running in um, interesting circles as well. So, oh yes, yes, here we go. Um, a lot of my work in um, African American puppetry or object performance has been looking at how this is an empowering practice for people who have been objectified, who have been commodity objects, whose bodies have been bought and sold. Um, and so, who was it that talked about the sculptor? You, yes. I also wanted to ask you about um, whether that sculptor used her work to comment on the objectification of women's bodies. And then from there, um, I also wanted to go to the question of the extent to which, since mo we have a lot of dance in the shows here, the extent to which the human body itself can function as an object in performance on occasion. Does that make sense? Yes? I okay. think so, yes, it's very <laughs> wide. Okay, yeah, it's wide, so I'm giving you plenty of rope to hang yourself yeah. with. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Would you still like to go first, Ishmael? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I try to climb the rope and not yes. to yes. hang myself. Yes. Great. Um, I try to climb on that rope. Uh, speaking about the um, human body, uh, which is uh, being um, well, let me reformulate it. Can uh, we use it as an yeah, object? Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, in, in the context of Invisible Ends that <laughs> we are performing here, um, we uh, find out that uh, there is a certain, uh, well, we are telling a certain narrative, but then we are also using, uh, we're using the body as the tool, but then there, the body itself has a certain narrative. Mm -hmm. Because it dictates, uh, once you used it, as the scenography, mm -hmm. and as the part, uh, not only scenography, because as, as you were speaking about the entanglement, mm -hmm. it's not separate. Uh, it becomes also a, a protagonist. Uh, so it dictates a certain uh, narrative for us to use, and then it has also a certain memory. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this, uh, uh, the idea of em empowerment, uh, when we are dealing with this, uh, well, we're dealing with a theme that is, we're speaking about people that are, I don't know what is the term, disempowered. Yes. Uh, uh, the, um, the immigrants and refugees. And uh, we are uh, giving them, um, like, memory space mm -hmm. on yeah. our bodies. Yes. Like, uh, and the objects and this. Mm -hmm. And in this way, it is, uh, uh, I'm, I'm speaking, uh, uh, based on feedback that we got from from people that have been through this mm -hmm. kind of things, so so they they saw their own story mm -hmm. uh, in in our bodies and the bodies of the like the objects in in this sense it is uh, the body can uh, convey uh, memories and narratives and yeah in this way it is empowering mm -hmm. empowering. Okay, great. I think you got to the top of the rope and rang the bell. <laughs> <laughs> great. So I'm going to put a pin in that um, how stories empower people, but I'll come back okay. to that after yeah. we hear from Julie and Camille. So. Um, uh, that's interesting. How to answer to that? Um, I mean, uh, I guess, ob what is object? What object uh, means the uh, first question? Yay. I don't okay. know. <laughs> Did you study I chez les Jesuites? <laughs> <laughs> that's the first thing they do is, oh, we got to yeah, define the terms. <laughs> this is my philosophy training. You yes. Know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, um, what is, I guess it's what is object, uh, objectified or defined by the others. Mm -hmm. I mean, so that's interesting to uh, wondering about for example, anywhere, there is Oedipus as a puppet, there is Antigone as a human being, and which is the most defined by the, ex the exteriorly or the others, who, between the two of them, as uh, Oedipus, as Antig Antigone, or um, really, are, they are myths that are um, um, shaped, uh, I mean, the, um, the subject uh, itself, Oedipus, is shaped by the other. Uh, his life, uh, it doesn't uh, di um, belongs to to himself. Mm -hmm. The same with uh, maybe so. Oedipus maybe is like more than defined by the others, and mm -hmm. Antigone is another process. She is trying to. She's trying to, to belongs her life to get it from the others, but it finally doesn't work neither. <laughs> it's mid, uh, a tragedy. Uh, and I, I would say that for anywhere, I would say that for me, they are exactly on the same level. They are both objected, object, objected by the others, mm -hmm. objectified. I don't know how you say that. Uh, sorry. OK, thank you. I, I have stuff to work with there, too. Thank you so much. <laughs> OK, come in. Okay, I'll, I'll have a go. <laughs> um, maybe for me, the question of having puppets on stage will um, will give will prevent from objectivation of the body mm. because it gives more freedom to the body of the actor. Uh, for example. Um, you can perform whatever you want as a puppeteer. You can you can be a male or female, young uh, uh, or, or old, and you have a, a real freedom compared to what your appearance is. Um, and for young uh, actors, uh, actress, it's like a, a playground, a huge playground, and not to be objectivized by your 
uh, own body, uh, what do you look like, how do you look like, uh, how you, you, I mean, it's like you can, you can open the doors. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, it was like a revelation when I was 20. It was <laughs> like, wow, <laughs> such, a, such a huge <laughs> playground. And I still believe um, now that uh, um, in between the body of the performer and the object, this freedom is uh, active. Mm -hmm. It's still active for me. Uh, nevertheless, what you're, you're in real life, you have a imaginary body uh, revealed by the puppet on stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that was that's great. my feeling. <laughs> yeah, no, that was that was great. That was great. These are all very rich answers. So I'm going to um, wrap up the panel conversation and open the floor for questions from the audience. We hope that some of you have questions or comments or things you would like to interject into the conversation. Um, and I just want to finish with the point of um, what Ishmael said about stories. Was it Ishmael or Julie that brought up stories um, and empowerment? What happened in the case of um, enslaved people and refugees is that their stories get erased. And the erasure of their individual stories is what turns them into objects to be acted upon instead of agents who can define their own lives. So I like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, please come up to the microphone if you have questions. Don't be shy. Yay. Come on up. Thank you for being brave and asking the first question. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you so much for your presentations. It's an honor to listen to each of you. Um, as Ishmael noted, centering the body in performance, whether it's a puppet body or a human performer, can elicit physical empathy from the, the audience. My question is for all the presenters, how does working with a puppet affect the body of the human performer? How does your body feel or how does it change when you are working with a puppet? And has that experience changed your day-to-day -day somatic experience? Mm. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Interesting. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Would you like to take that first, Camille? Oh. Um, yes, of course, uh, the body is, uh, is really uh, at stake uh, when you're dealing with puppets because it depends on the size of the puppet, the weight of the puppet, the, the, the manipulation, but your body is a tool that will uh, give the puppet the energy. It's, so, um, to my opinion, it was a long it was a long way, as you said, to understand very well my uh, physical uh, scheme and my gravity center to be able to, to put the gravity center uh, elsewhere in front of me or next to me or behind me. <laughs> I mean, it's all the time how the puppet, the work with the puppet, move your center to, uh, to a certain extent. And, um, in order not to get pain. And <laughs> with this kind of uh, practice, uh, I think you have to, 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 to train every day and to, because, um, and to be very uh, soft in your way of uh, dealing with this, not to be like, <laughs> like this. At first, when I was uh, performing, I was like uh, too much energy. <laughs> And uh, the pain arrived with this, and then after a while, you you you, you really uh, recognize that it's a, 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 uh, a moving from your center of gravity, and that you will assume it with a, a lot of softness, and and that you you will be able to keep it in the time. So, for me, it, it made me learn more about my own body to to to, to perform with puppets. Shall we just go down the row? All right. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
yeah, I can well connect uh, or co comment on this uh, in this way that uh, I feel uh, that uh, the the puppets or the performing objects they they own certain shares of my body, uh, and uh, certain parts of my body are uh, I would say periodically uh, subject to to uh, the, the the like performing times and this. Uh, but not only on stage, uh, it can be many months before and after, they, they belong to, to uh, the puppets. Mm -hmm. So uh, like my leg, for example, uh, uh, that has this uh, row of, uh, of uh, humans on it, it's, uh, it becomes a part of the awareness that uh, I know that uh, oh, it's, not, it's not only mine. I, I, uh, <laughs> I'm just... Uh, I'm just carrying it around, <laughs> but uh, th but they will then uh, use it. It will happen there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like you have. Um, it's like you're owning uh, a, a restaurant, but uh, it's not like uh, yeah. It's uh, you know you you know there will be people there. There will be I don't know weddings or whatever happening. So <laughs> in this case, uh, yeah, I, I I lose I lose some of uh, my independence, <laughs> but it's not a negative thing. It's uh, kind of nice to know that mm -hmm. I, yeah. Yes. So the entanglement <laughs> continues. Yes, in this sense, yeah. And it's uh, in, in the, um, on the level of awareness, uh, mm -hmm. it continues. And it is, in a way, it is animistic in, in, this, uh, in this way, that it's not, uh, you don't put the border. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, like, the, you're speaking about the uh, body image mm -hmm. and this. Mm -hmm. So there is a one body image of how people uh, see me and how they define me, but it's, it's only one. Mm -hmm. Then there are also other, because there are also others that mm -hmm. are, uh, other things that are using my body, like my body, mm -hmm. so, yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, I can try to answer from outside, <laughs> because just, for being there during creating process, uh, I would say that for me it's quite it's really interesting to see how the puppeteer, when they're training, trying to control the puppet to find the, the best way to make it alive, uh, alive, and uh, so there is so many trainings, say very uh, how to say uh, very um, mindly powerful uh, training. How it does or does it work? That doesn't work. That everything. And then during the show, there is something magic that sometimes the puppet it seems to be uh, autonomous and it's beyond the puppeteer. And it's magic for the spectator from outside, but then when you discuss with the artist itself, the puppeteer says, at this moment, I don't know what's happening, what happens, but it was beyond me and it was beyond my control, beyond my body, beyond my training, so that's it for me. <laughs> it's very true and sometimes even you feel that uh, in, during the rehearsal, the puppet is very heavy. Yeah. <laughs> and suddenly uh, you don't feel anything anymore. It's, it's like, a it's not even material, it's very light and it, it moves all alone. And yeah, it's true, it's yeah. a kind of uh, magic. Uh, yeah. Also, it comes to my mind uh, an example that there is, uh, there is another show. Uh, 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 there is a well, it's a, it's a big lion character that I manipulate, and uh, the lion has uh, this uh, voice. Is is I, I cannot I cannot do it now. I cannot do it, uh, and uh, I never got a real uh, voice uh, practice in this. But uh, when uh, uh, this hand goes inside. And uh, and on, stay, on on real performance, uh, it it just I can uh, talk for one hour from this uh, or the lion can talk, and I don't feel it at all. But if I try outside uh, of the performance, uh, I my voice is dead after a few <laughs> seconds. That's magic. And yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Very good. Very good. Do we have another question from the floor, please? Yes, come forward. Um, so, in the kind of inverse of that question, um, kind of, I'm wondering on the effects of performance and the puppeteer on the puppet or object, um, 
the like catalyst for that thought was the there was a photo from the practice with the ice puppet of someone wearing gloves so the heat of their hands wouldn't affect the puppet, but then in performance, how the heat leaves a memory. And I think, Ishmael, you mentioned the body having a certain narrative, a certain memory, and how that memory of the body and performance is translated to the object, the puppet, in addition to the natural wear down of using materials, if that is somewhat clear. <laughs> the, yeah, the effects of performing the puppet on the puppet, both in the animus and the uh, like wear. You mean the effect of, what, what is the effect of performing the puppet on the puppet itself? Ah, yeah, yeah, in the, in the way that you yeah. all feel the effects of performing on yourselves. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the reverse question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, maybe I, I start. <laughs> okay, um, I've been uh, experiencing that some of my puppets have been performing like uh, 500 times, and some of them are uh, made out of paper. <laughs> so at first, um, the first thought was, it will not last more than five uh, performance, and then it lasts. So there is something like a mystery inside this. Um, and I, I notice as well uh, that uh, if you make an exchange of role, uh, the puppet will be in danger because the, the fragility of the material uh, it it's all worked in one side with one puppet in one side in one side for f 100 times and then suddenly you you change the, the the puppeteer you change the role and it becomes very fragile it crack it um, so in my opinion there is a link very strong in between the puppeteer and the the way manipulate the the, the puppet and it gives him uh, softness and uh, strengthness in like a, a big sportive, you know, like athletic sportive that makes work the, the, the muscle always in the same uh, side and it's the same with the puppet. And um, to me, there is as well like physical uh, thing to, to think about and magical both because we were a little <laughs> bit in between the two. Um, but puppets, um, usually take more uh, energy and more uh, density in performing more, but there is a fragility that can uh, happen, uh, as I've described. That's mm. my... Uh, mm. okay. yeah. Um, yeah, there the, the, the are some... Uh, Thinking about the body of the puppets that is uh, uh, experiencing things and it, they leave their marks on it, uh, it's very hard to separate or maybe impossible to separate uh, my, what is my image of the experience of the pup, uh -huh. puppet body and what is happening because uh, f like a, a, a puppet it can be some um, styrofoam and wood or something like this and, and then I say Oh, it's just styrofoam and wood and uh, some glue here and this, uh, so there's, it's not uh, like, it's not a body mm -hmm. in this. Mm -hmm. But then uh, uh, the puppet can look at me and say, well, it's 60% uh, water, it's, uh, it's uh, this. Uh, yeah, there are some uh, pipes going like this. Uh, it's not a body, it's just a collection of, uh, of some uh, mm -hmm. materials. And, and when I perform, uh, and also after, uh, I, I really, uh, I really feel it's it's a it's it's a real body mm. uh, uh, in this sense. Uh, and if something happens, it gets a hit or something like this. Mm. It uh, it hurts in this way that uh, mm. I think that oh, it, I, it kind of uh, remembers that the, it was uh, uh, hurt. Um, yeah, it's animistic. Uh, uh, I think there's nothing uh, there's nothing supernatural. And this, mm -hmm. it's natural only, mm -hmm. but yeah. it's, yeah, it works. Mm -hmm. Julie? 
Um, as uh, in any way, it's a nice puppet. It's very uh, particular because it exists only during, I, I, I would say, 20 hours of uh, bur burning, uh, bur a birth, of, of birth. <laughs> Um, and um, then for hours, three hours uh, of uh, a real existence. So this is really something particular. Um, of course, each night it's a different puppet because of this material, so unstainable, like water and ice. So it's never the same. Uh, and there's the puppeter. Uh, each day, the puppeter make the puppets, the ice puppet, and then perform with it. It's connected with very long strings. So the the persons who animate the puppets is him in the in the backstage. But the 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 one who's uh, the more uh, uh, reacting, acting on the puppet is the performer, dancers who's in the the puppets. So that's very interesting. That finally the. The one who um, um, uh, is in contact with the puppets the more closely is the one who is the most exterior of it and is the, the one who will be able to make it change the, the most. And I could say that there, there's a difference between the US and French version that's, that's quite interesting that Elise Vigneron, so she's the, the one who's is performing with the puppets, the, the body in the French version. She is she doesn't hesitate to 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 be uh, really hard and rude with the puppet, to accelerate its melting, its melting, to 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 put the ephemer in the center, to say it's cracking, to to be very hard with it. And um, the dancer here, Ashwati, uh, who's performing the US version, she doesn't really know how to do with it because, of course, it's her first experience with puppets, so she's very respectful because of this. It's so many times of processing and everything, so she's very respectful, and we say to her, you have to be rude, you have to crush, and she's, it's very hard for her to, 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 to be, uh, and, and that's very, um, that's very moving for all the team because at the end the puppet is quite melting, but it's still human body, and we put it in a bucket and we wash, we uh, open the 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 water, hot water, and we're looking at it uh, very very hardly, uh, very quickly melting in the bucket. So this is very particular experience <laughs> with puppet, and mm -hmm. I guess the puppeteer have to be very more detached than for your other mm -hmm. other shows where there is this very strong relationship between mm -hmm. puppets and mm -hmm. here you have to be detached mm -hmm. <laughs> i guess okay thank you we have time for more questions if someone else would like to, oh thank you I, I figured anthony would have something to say so let's hear it um so you all kind of talked about your process a little bit and about how you all tended to start with the compositions and the physical forms, sort of like the images and movements of what was going on, and then you sort of came to the themes or found a text to relate it to or created your own text. Uh, so I guess starting with those um, movements and really sort of getting to the meat first and getting to those feelings you have and expressing them in the physical world and then trying to bridge that important feeling you have with a text or a theme and making that connection. Uh, how do you follow through with that process? How do, how do you get over the struggle of making sacrifices to those feelings you started with in order to connect it to uh, those text themes and finding more feelings? Okay, I can start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 I don't. Th there, there is not really a contradiction in for us uh, when we work between this, uh, these two. It's, uh, it's more that uh, yeah, it's nice to 
nice to find out that we, we all share this, that we start mm -hmm. with some, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, some materials, some puppets and this, mm -hmm. and then we find the, uh, for, for us, it's, uh, the interest uh, always come first uh, uh, with uh, a concept of working with certain material on stage uh, and the body. Uh, and uh, then uh, we trust that it has uh, enough, its own narrative, it, it has things to tell. Uh, and uh, we try to not impose a story on it uh, for as long as possible. And uh, a, a theme would come eventually uh, because the world is kind of full of theme <laughs> all the time. Uh, and I think it's uh, uh, also good, good stories that they're like garbage. It's not the, uh, maybe the art is to, to choose and uh, or to know when the right one comes to you, then you, you okay, you grab it, mm -hmm. but uh, you don't go and open uh, encyclopedia and start <laughs> to look for a good story because uh, it's endless. Uh, and then uh, by first, uh, uh, making the process as much as possible uh, with the with the materials uh, or the objects that we work with, then we allow them to to kind of dictate what kind of uh, language we use, and then only in the very end we we take some uh, some kind of theme from the outside world, and then it's uh, it's still there. It's there. It's relevant, but it's being told in a different way because uh, the. The, the object's pretty much telling it. Yeah. Uh, really, really well, uh, well said. I, mm. I guess it's very close the, that Ellie's process, so I don't have much things to add. It's, it's mm. really, really close. At the beginning of the process, there is a very, um, uh, it's very um, texty. I don't know how to say that. There's lots of texts. And during the process, the text is disappearing just to keep the essence of the novel or of the original uh, text. Uh, so it's always always like that in every sh in every show. But for the rest, the the other <laughs> party, uh, it's the same. I, I guess, yeah. Yes. Um, maybe it's still the the shock uh, when. You, you read Arto for the first time, the, 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 the story of putting things on stage and that, that something will happen, a truth, uh, by putting the things on the material and the body and all the elements on stage with, along together with the text. There is a truth that you have to reveal during the rehearsal. And, but it, it is already there at the beginning of the work, something like this. And then you, you, you have like a, or maybe another image would be you have a block of marble and you start uh, at the beginning of the rehearsal, but the, the shape is already inside the block. And um, the, the difficult thing is not to go too fast to Put up, put up the noise, <laughs> the noise <laughs> of your sculpture, <laughs> you know. So you have to be very delicate during the rehearsal because you have to find the shape without a little bit in the darkness, <laughs> like a sculpture in the darkness with a frontal. <laughs> and you have to, to be delicate not to, to, um, to hurt the, the shame inside. Uh, and then after each time, I felt that the process of creation is like, um, I don't know the word in English, a day. It's um, a morning. A morning, because you have to, to, to leave some part of the, your idea, you have to leave them apart in order to, to, to really approach the real shape of, of your show. And, but you had many other ideas you wanted to have and you have to, to leave them, uh, and I think it's that uh, the thing I'm doing another show. It's with all the ideas I, I couldn't uh, <laughs> put in this one, <laughs> and I want to <laughs> to have another show to to to, to deal with them. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. 
So we're at five minutes. I think that gives us time for one more question. Is there anyone else who would like to come to the mic? Yes, come on up. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I guess that brings us to the end. I want to put in a little plug for the festival's um, workshops because I'm planning to teach one in the spring on this kind of discussion. You know, the whole post-human, object-oriented ontology, yada, 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 and um, make it digestible the way that it was this morning, thanks to the panelists. And to you all for coming, and to the tech crew for bearing with our disorganization in the beginning. And uh, thank you. Yes, thank you, Paula. And, and just to add to that very quickly, uh, it's th this uh, uh, panel discussion and the, and the other ones have been live streamed through HowlRound, which is a, a, a platform. And, and it'll be saved there too. If there's so, if you're like, oh, I want to hear a little bit of what that was again, you could uh, return to them and, and hear them. Um, and uh, the, since Paulette mentioned it, uh, we do offer classes and workshops through the festival here in in Chicago. So in our studio in, uh, on the fourth floor, which currently is a cafe, it's not usually a cafe. It's usually a puppet studio. Um, and uh, but uh, the, so they're in-person classes. But the class that she was referring to is an online class. We have several online classes, uh, classes where you make stuff. You build puppets, you build shadow, you make shadow puppet shows. Uh, and, uh, and so if you do not live in Chicago, you can still get trained on how to make a toy theater show or a shadow puppet show likewise. So um, uh, you, you can check that out on our website. So without further ado, thank you so much. We'll have another one. We'll convene again at one o'clock. Thank you. Thank you.